Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Debate. Today, we'll be asking a deceptively simple question. Whose responsibility is the climate? We'll endeavour to explore the possible impact to be made by the individual, big businesses, activists and government, with the help of two very special guests. I'm joined today by Gina Dowding, who was, up until last Friday, a Green MEP for the North West, and Joel Stone, representing Extinction Rebellion, Manchester. Um, we're going to kick off by um, asking you to outline where you stand on the question of the environment and of responsibility. So if we'd like to start with Gina. Thanks, yeah. Well, as you said, until last Friday, I just had seven month, uh, eight months in the European Parliament representing the Green Party. And, um, you know, that was a pinnacle of my sort of elected Green career, if you like. I was first elected as a Green to Lancaster City Council 20 years ago. And, um, and, and I had been a member for quite a long time before that. And I, and I have also more recently taken part in direct action. So I feel as though when we're talking about individual responsibility, there's a whole, way, whole range of things that we can do as individuals. But I, from a political point of view, which is where I decided to sort of, um, you know, put my energy, mm -hmm. is I feel as though basically it's about systems change. So individual responsibility important, but ultimately, for me, it's about systems change. So social responsibility yeah, to social, act and influence. Exactly, yeah. Excellent. Joel? Um, I mean, I, I, I guess completely echo that, really. I think Extinction Rebellion's fundamental purpose has been to try and shift the focus away from this idea of individual personal lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of money has been spent um, shifting the onus onto individuals. This idea of conscious consumerism has been crafted very carefully um, and it's not been an accident that that's been where a lot of like environmentalism has been, uh, a lot of the energy has been channeled into. Um, and I think uh, a big part of Extinction Rebellion's like fundamental reason for being is to totally shift that narrative um, towards yeah, systems change, mm. um, away from the idea that we can fix this by working as atomized individuals and appreciate that you know, it's a handful of um, mega corporations that do the vast uh, like majority of the damage to the climate, to the world's ecosystems. Um, if you're a working class person in any country in the world, your level of ability to influence just by your own behavior is, is you know, yeah. marginal. Um, and I think, yeah, the more people come to grasp that, I think that's where that's where I'm coming from. I think that's where Extinction Rebellion are really coming from. Definitely. Well. So you mentioned there the individual through the lens of consumer. I'm sure we'll get a really good chance to, to delve into that within this first segment. Um, I would like to start with um, a statistic that we got off YouGov. Uh, there's a poll, an ongoing poll, that, um, that's last instalment, it's the end of last year. Um, and it says that... Um, when Brits make decisions about food, they asked how much they take into account the, the aspect of sustainability. 38% um, said a fair amount, 30% uh, said not very much, while only 16% said to a large extent, and 12%, not too far off to a large amount, said not at all. So I guess my first question is, is, in, is it indifference that is killing the planet to some extent? I don't think so. I mean, I've, my background, uh, professionally was in public health and so that was you know focusing more on uh, population health and individual health and the sort of slogan in the 80s and 90s was we need to make the healthy choices the easiest choices mm -hmm. so you know it's again people um, at the moment even trying to make an environmentally uh, friendly choice or a climate related choice it's very confusing you know if you look at um, you know how bad are bananas, you know, there's that book, yeah. you know, like sort of like, or um, avocados if they're being mm. shipped from somewhere else, yeah. and then, or... Almond milk, coconut yeah, water, all those the, the things. So, you know, and it's like, moment, yeah. so basically because we've got a system where the, the environmental cost or the climate cost isn't integrated, so it's, it's an externalised cost, so basically I, I personally think that people would make... Um, those choice, you know, environmentally friendly choices. If they were easier, less confu confusing, and not always more expensive, because mm. at the moment I think businesses are charging a premium, and um, capitalising capitalising on, on, yeah. on that cost. And really, it's up to the 
to the whole system to if we've got to save the planet i think you know there's not many people who don't want to save the planet that to integrate the right cho the the right factors into the things that we're buying you know mm. through cost basically yeah. if we're if we're adopting yeah. um you know that approach and um but there, oh, sorry i don't know whether joel's got something to add on that in itself but there's also the thing about um you know we've all got responsibility to actually challenge the system so there's an there's an individual, responsibility, individual responsibility as well so it's like it's not just about as a consumer but as a citizen in a democracy and to get engaged challenge the information be mm -hmm. politically engaged and that's sort of small p as well as you know doesn't necessarily mean joining a party or standing for a party but actually just being engaged in mm. these issues even if it's in discussion with friends Absolutely. at the pub yeah. yeah yeah um i mean joel you did say in your opening statement there that the sort of actual the power of each individual particularly from poorer backgrounds is fairly minimal and we do need some sort of societal change um do we do we sort of agree then that most people are going about their day-to-day -day lives and don't perhaps have the luxury to enact changes that they would like to. Yeah, I mean, I think your original question used the word indif like, was it, was indifference, like indifference is yeah. going to find it. Um, yeah, I, I think that's probably an unfair framing because I think for a lot of people, it is a luxury, like having the, the time and the energy to even think about, you know, beyond next week for a lot of people mm. is not an option because their electricity is getting turned off tomorrow yeah. if they can't find money. Yeah. to put on the key. Like, You're asking people to think six generations in the future. Yeah, or, well, when, I mean, even one generation, but yeah. even next year, like for a lot of people, like we have an economy that is in, in this country is increasingly precarious for a lot mm -hmm. of people. It's, it's meant to be, like it's, it's built around insecure work on not having the protections that people spent decades fighting for. Um, so it's unsurprising that, yeah, trying to think about any, you know, things. Um, and I just think it's a bizarre situation where Fair trade is a brand. Mm -hmm. It's not a legally enforced principle, which kind of, if, if something's fair trade and everything else isn't, that kind of quite clearly implies that it's unfairly traded for. Mm. And that's, but you're allowed to trade unfairly. Like if we say that these products are ethically produced, that quite clearly suggests that these ones were uneth like mm -hmm. not produced ethically. Why is that allowed? Why do mm. we like acknowledge that these things were done in a harmful way but it's legal to sell them, it's legal to produce them in this way that we kind of acknowledge is, is wrong, is harmful. <clears throat> um, and that, yeah, that comes back from legislation, that comes from having a system set up where you are allowed to behave in ways that are harmful, but, but because you hold the power, you can get away with it. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think you just see how one-sided that, you know, power dynamic is, like the really big players can get away with causing untold damage to mm -hmm ecosystems, whereas if an individual um, did that similar thing, they'd obviously be in a lot of trouble. Yeah. I think um, there's an, oh, well, I was no, just going to say, I think, I mean, I think you're absolutely right that, you know, a lot of people are, you know, too busy, too time poor, or, um, you know, just not able to focus on the big picture stuff and challenge it. But I also feel as though, um, from my experience, and I always do my mum test, you know, my mum was not politically engaged at all. Um, and she kind of had this inherent faith that, you know, she was, you know, the system was looking after her, that they, we didn't mm. have to engage. Oh, they wouldn't allow that to happen. It can't be that bad. And I think a lot of people still feel as though, actually, you know, we've got a government. We do live in, you know, we're in a democracy, democracy of sorts, and that actually it can't really be that bad. You know, it can't really, you know, it's not that much of an emergency because somebody in government will be doing something about it. Mm. And that's what I think is quite scary is that, you know, we've got reason to believe now that we don't have a government that is actually looking after our interests or the interests of, you know, younger people anymore. That, you know, they have let it get this bad because they have been bought out or in too influenced by um, the corporate <coughs> world. So, yeah, so I think, you know, even it's not even just a, about um, people not being able to, because um, they haven't got the... Um, you know, the resources to look at these issues, that there's still an element where lots of people just cannot believe it's this bad. So mm. I think, there is, you know, it's, it's not that they're in denial, but they just don't believe that the system could be that bad or the government could be that bad, that it's that much of a crisis. And can I just, like... Do you agree? Just, just to, I, yeah, I completely. And I think we underestimate because we... 
people, we spend so, so much time complaining about the government and like, mm -hmm. you know, British people love a good moan. But I think people's kind of deep faith in authority yeah. is yeah. actually still really like prevalent. And yeah. like, people don't even realize how deeply they do actually fundamentally think they must be taking it. They must have a handle on it. They must have yeah. a plan because to fundamentally believe that like, no, they don't. And mm -hmm. if this is allowed to continue, you you not go, you won't believe how bad it's going to get, um, because it's a terrifying thing to, to accept. So it's understandable yeah, that people absolutely. don't want to engage with that. But yeah, yeah. I think that's um, very. I think that's exactly. Extinction Rebellion's yeah. purpose in sounding that alarm is saying that actually, we we haven't got this, <laughs> and they yeah. haven't got this, and the social contract like mm -hmm. is the, the the words we've used. The social contract is broken. Okay, so we'll, we'll come to the government in much more <laughs> detail later on. Um, we mentioned social contract there. I uh, fear that we're verging into the collective and away from the individual, which I understand would be a, a political stance mm. of yours, um, nonetheless. Um, I just wanted to probe a little bit where sort of morally, I mean, we had a little discussion before about morals and, and, and the philosophy undergrad that you did, um, of where morally an individual can position himself. Because if we see environmentalism as a movement, essentially, and all movements have their philosophers, if you want to make it mm. academic and maybe a little bit bucky, um, I think some people maybe would benefit from it being boiled down and really pinned down. Um, we tend to think of principles as, as absolutes that you know, can't be transgressed. What is the absolute for you in environmentalism? Because I mean, I could, I could throw loads of practical ethics um, questions at you and, and make it quite boring, but um, I, I won't. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we could use any sort of extreme example. Reproducing, for example, would be... Yeah. Um, if you didn't reproduce, if the individual chose not to reproduce, it would have a massive impact on his carbon footprint for the better. Um, simply, if you want to put it in Nietzschean terms, not existing would be the best thing that you could do for the environment. What is the moral absolute and in what circumstances can it be transgressed if you can morally say, I am fighting for the environment? Can I just... Yeah, actually, yeah, like, yeah, just, be, just because something you said there actually makes me go, ooh. Um, I don't like... I, th I think it's a bit of a... When you see these like uh, infographics that rate different things that you can do to limit your mm -hmm. carbon footprint, you know, not go go vegan, don't fly, don't use a car, and some of them have recently been doing like, oh, what you know, tops all of this is not having a child, mm -hmm. um, which seems on the face of it to me nonsensical because that child is a separate being who has their own carbon footprint. The non that doesn't include, that's not factored into your carbon footprint. Like, to, it's just, just on the face of it, that maths is very suspect. But then far more important than that, the focus on overpopulation is a very dangerous, um, and I think just misguided um, idea. Like, consumption. It's like, people in the global north, especially in North America, consume and produce emissions of hundreds of times the rate of people in um, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so not only is the focus on population just misguided if you're actually trying to deal with the problem. And perhaps not as nuanced. Yeah, but I think also it feeds into potentially quite dangerous, racist, colonial yeah. narratives. Um, so that's why I, I wouldn't... Um, and Extinction Rebellion is quite associated with the birth strike movement. I, I was uh, with mm -hmm. a friend the other day who actually started that. Um, and that's been quite significantly um, misconstrued as being about, like, I'm not going to have children because of population issues. It's not about that. It's the whole birth strike movement is saying, I don't feel safe to have a child and bring a child into this world. Given the Looking at how dark our, you know, forecasts currently are. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, sorry, just, just so yeah, I would, I'd be very, very cautious about talking mm -hmm. about the um, reproducing and population. Mm -hmm. I think you've got to be very careful mm -hmm. about um, how you talk about that and what the agenda is mm -hmm. behind people who do want to talk about that or mm -hmm. focus on that. Um, in terms of the overall question of like the principle, um, I think a lot of people in Extinction Rebellion might not even... I mean, I think the label environmentalist is uh, not one that I'd leap at taking on myself because I think seeing, like, the environment and then, like, human society and welfare as separate mm -hmm. um, is, is maybe a, a big mistake. Mm -hmm. um, so... Can I, mean, I go one further? Because uh, uh, people often say to me about, you know, being green. I, I mean, I know I am a green party. <laughs> but... Um, for me, there's, you know, being green is, is so much more than just being about concerned about the environment or the climate. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the really important thing is about um, the, you know, like 
the welfare of people, but there's something about the system as well, and it's a, it's got to be bottom up. So it's about yeah. involving people. You know, totalitarianism <coughs> isn't the solution, or authoritarianism. You know, so. Um, I mean, even on a very practical level, you know, it's, it's a hard sell to, <laughs> to, to tell people, actually, do you want this freedom is all or about, not? yeah, do you want, <laughs> yeah. I'm all right. So, you know, for that sort of freedom and um, freedom of expression and, and all that is so important. And so I think that it, when people misconstrue what, yeah, like you say, the, um, the label environment, environmentalism isn't accurate enough to encompass what this movement is about, if you yeah. like, that it's about um, mm -hmm. yeah. empowering people to look after each other and the mm. planet. You know, all of those things together. But yeah. it is also about empowering people. Well, it's interesting now that you use the, the term bottom up, which, um, again, I think this could do with some exploring for a lot of people. Um, we talked earlier about, um, particularly with the individuals consuming, talked about fair trade products and it sort of almost being um, encapsulated and sort of taken into a pre-existing maybe capitalist model but do you think from that bottom-up perspective that consumers do have power I mean we're talking about a government which you know monumental change would, is what would be ideal from both of your standpoints but in the current climate where free market libertarianism is still very much rife um, what power does the consumer have well, we've got to stop uh, just um, describing people as consumers. Oh, no, certainly, but with individuals with, as consumers yeah. in the sort of capitalist philosophy, if we're, going to, if we're going to look at it in that way. is As consumers, what power can they have? What can they demand? Can they force change? Because the beauty of what, the supposed beauty of the free market is that it, the profit principle is a very simple um, formula of supply and demand. So if the demand is there, it will be supplied. Can we rally to force businesses to act ethically? Well, the, we, I think we probably would agree that the model is flawed because that was yeah. all about, you know, perfect information for yeah. the consumer to make the decision. And that's where it all falls mm -hmm. down because we don't have the information we need. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's like literally hidden mm -hmm. um, as to what actually is going on in the supply chains and all those things. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's, it's almost gone beyond expect. It's such, so sophisticated um, and there's so many different issues to be looked at that we, we cannot expect individual consumers to be making those hundreds of micro <coughs> balancing different arguments together yeah. every time they buy a can of beans or um, <laughs> you know whatever it is you know it's just too 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 much Definitely, and that's yeah. why it's got we've got to shift that responsibility upstream to the producers and the and the, the companies yeah so I think consumers as in their purchasing power it's too much almost too much to expect people can do what they can but it's about can, making consumers citizens and using mm. their <coughs> political power yeah. to, to enforce change. You've used two buzzwords there that I know Joel is going to jump on. All right, okay. We had um, <laughs> transparency, not the exact word that you use, but information, being able to see. And I think in the Extinction Rebellion sort of manifesto, as it were, truth is the word that's used. Um, yeah. And then you also said citizens, and I know that we'll get onto the citizens <laughs> assembly later in government, but um, first of all, and truth. I, I think just the question, like, um, and I suppose with transparency and truth, um, the idea that where there's a demand, the supply will meet it. Um, and it's just it's funny because I, I, it was like a couple of weeks ago, Coca-Cola, I think, came out and said, people want plastic bottles. Mm -hmm. And you get you know, fossil fuel companies saying, well, as long as people want the you know, <coughs> petrol, yeah. we'll keep. And like, what nonsense. Like, billions upon billions are spell, uh, spent on advertising and marketing campaigns um, and propaganda by these uh, institutions to create a demand that they're already, you know, ready to supply. Mm. Like, um, there's a reason that Coca-Cola, everyone knows Coca-Cola, they still advertise constantly because they never want people to forget, oh, do you want a Coke? Um, the same with the fossil fuel companies. Like, the idea they've not spent, well, we know they've spent billions influencing the political system, making sure that that demand for their product remains, even when it should have become largely redundant yeah. years ago. If, if, mm. if the real... Um, if free markets were real, um, we'd have moved on to renewables a long time ago. But of course, they're not. Like the, the people with the power want to hold on to the power. Um, so I think consumers, in theory, would have you know pe people as consumers, if they all you know got together, collectivized, said we're not going to buy these products anymore. That is, in theory, <laughs> a huge amount of power. But it ignores the fact that the people who control the media control what people see, like the advertising and marketing, spend so much influencing people's 
choices. Mm. Um, the, what, how do we combat that? So you think it's hard for those consumers, individual citizens, to mobilise in their, in their sort of role that they've been cast as consumers. It's hard for them to mobilise and to group together and say, no, we don't accept that. Yeah. Because they're left alone as individuals. And because huge amounts of energy and time are invested on making people want the newest SUV, to want to fly to, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, yeah. Spain for 20 quid. Um, you know, people aren't free to make these rational, like you said, these, this idea that people are making rational, rational informed yeah. decisions. Mm. Um, a lot of, you know, clever psychology is put into making people make certain decisions, which make a lot of people a lot of money. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we, sure we can tear this next statistic <laughs> to pieces then. Um, another YouGov poll. Um, I think my co-producer has a bit of a fetish for them, but I think that he's come up with some good stuff. 60% um, of people said that the political stance of a company would not affect their decision to shop there. So whilst we're talking about businesses and perhaps the lack of regulation that's forcing them to act ethically, um, what do we think? And only 21% would actively, and that isn't to say exclusively, of course, buy a brand which shares their political views. So did that goes along with what you're saying about... What was the first number? 60%. Uh, um, said that the political stance of a company would not affect their decision to shop there, i.e. they're essentially indifferent. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that that falls within a bell curve. I'm sure that if they came out and said something atrocious, then they, mm. they might take a stance. Um, but assuming that they have a pre-existing stance and the company doesn't agree with it, they would consider shopping there. So within the light of what you just said, how do we explain that psychology of the individual then? That having recognised that they don't agree with it, they would still go and buy it. Well, I, I just think it's interesting, just, I mean, I haven't seen the figure before, but it's like, do people, you know, are people thinking themselves even in a political context when they're shopping or mm. when they're just mm. trying to go about the, day go about the daily yeah. lives, you mm. know, and it's like, it's kind of like this huge um, demand now that people are expected to take responsibility for the state of the planet when actually they just want to get something for tea <laughs> that evening, you know, so it's kind of, you know, we're putting huge amounts of responsibility onto individuals um, and then you know there's all that kind of competitiveness and all that sort of stuff about you know virtue signaling by some people and criticizing other people Ooh, you, you say you're green but I've seen you mm -hmm. yeah I've seen you with a plastic wrap sandwich and all that you know so it's I, mm -hmm. I just think it's just um, quite a dangerous way to go uh, to, to frame the debate but who's interested in keeping it at that level you know so it's like mm. I think governments and companies are very happy, I think you said at the very beginning, they're very happy for this to all be put back to, to the individual so um, you know they can say that they're responding or the demand's not there or whatever. Mm. Um, so there's vested interests in ensuring yeah. that the debate is always about individual responsibility. And they can admonish themselves with guilt. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, just as a, a bridge perhaps between this discussion about business um, before we move on to activism, um, how much power do you think that, we'll go and move on to Extinction Rebellion in particular, how much power do you think that these demands are having? I mean, Greta Thunberg's big demand is stop fossil fuel production. All contracts should cease. Um, but before we move on to the power of the activism, just from a business point of view, do we think that some of the demands are realistic? I mean, would industries simply fall if tomorrow fossil fuel stopped? Would it be chaos? That's what a lot of people... I mean, think. this is why I think it's hard for any of us to truly, viscerally connect with the kind of transformation that needs to happen because it's, it's not something we can really imagine. We have no... Um, people use the Second World War, you know. Economies were transformed in a matter of weeks and months entirely onto a, on a total <coughs> war footing. Um, we've used that. Extinction Rebellion used to use that as like a, an example of how a society can be mobilised mm. to a transformative end in a very short space of time when an ex existential threat is recognised as such. But we need an even bigger transformation than that. Um, and I think, yeah, just saying, like, is it realistic? Hopefully a more positive one, then. Yes, yeah. and that's why. Yeah. And obviously yeah. there's, there's huge issues, and we'll talk about the Citizens' Assembly, like, if, like mm -hmm. the one thing Absolutely. that usually goes out of the window in wartime or other emergencies is democracy. Yeah. Um, mm. But, yeah, I, I think... Um, yeah, the, the, I mean, Greta uses it a lot, the, the metaphor of a house on fire. If your house <coughs> is on fire, there's people trapped inside, you're 
<laughs> you do what you can to put the fire out. If people go, oh, I don't think it's really realistic mm -hmm. uh, to put the fire out, <coughs> well, look, if we can get the, you know, the lounge we put out. We can reduce the fire by 10%. Within, th within three weeks. Okay. Like, you'd say, what are you talking about? There's people, they're going to die. The house is on fire. We're going to do anything we can. We're going to do everything we can to rescue as much as we can. Um, the question shouldn't be like, is it realistic? It's like, well, we, we have to do it. So we have to find a way. So I think it's a question of do it, deal with the consequences later. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, we've not even been allowed to imagine enough what that <coughs> decarbonised world looks like. You know, so mm. we've kind of constantly told this idea, oh, it will be chaos, it will be too difficult. And actually, you know, you start to break it down, it might not be that bad at all. That's, and that's what we're trying to sell, this what? idea that actually... You know, what are we producing that actually is a waste anyway that we don't need? You know, even, you know, just in terms of food production, we're wasting huge amounts. We can, and there are signs that we can actually be switching quite quickly to a renewable energy economy. Mm. You know, there's things waiting to come online around um, fuel, hydrogen fuel cells, and, you know, really produced by renewable energy. Um, <coughs> but the, you know, that's, that um, is almost as if it's only when the, you know, there's a there's a red line, the date you've got to do mm. it by then that it will force yeah. that switch over. You you mentioned the metaphor of the fire there and put it in the context of the long and short term. And it's not really a metaphor, is it? Well, <laughs> it's okay. also yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> harrowing events yeah. that you, you yeah. see on the news. Um, but in terms of the fire being put out, do you understand? Um, and I'm asking you to maybe express or conceptualise opinions which aren't your own here. Mm -hmm. Um, do you understand the nature of the concerns, I want, don't want to call them the opposition, but on the other side of the debate of, about action, um, that putting this fire out may well start other fires, or be them short-term fires, do you understand people's concerns surrounding those? Can, I mean, Absolutely. I, 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 I just, just, just simply, um, I don't believe their concerns are genuine. Mm -hmm. um, I think they are the noises made by people who currently hold all the cards in our society and who don't want to let any of them go. Um, if you're actually grounded in reality and you care about human well-being, you want the most urgent action on this physically possible. Either you don't really accept the physical reality that all the science tells us is real, <coughs> or your concern for human well-being is Questionable. <laughs> so I would say that, like, yeah. you, one way or another, you're getting something wrong. So anyone who's like on the other side, um, on, in yeah. terms of emergency action, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I yeah. really I take them seriously. And uh, there was just another element I was thinking when we were talking about corporate responsibility in business that I think is a separate case, and that's the whole financial uh, industry or sector, which actually isn't really producing much at all. But actually, mm. it holds the rest. It holds the. Um, <laughs> so many other areas uh, hostage. So, you know, I mean, I've been on, I'm going, I've come back to the UK from being an MEP, but I have been a councillor for a long time and I'm on the pensions mm -hmm. committee, which is a huge amount of money. And it's amazing how, um, so, so you could almost say that in terms of local government, it's the only place that there is any money, you know, managing that pot of money for pensioners for a whole range of sectors. And it's really interesting how, so many arguments are coming from the financial sector and it's all about future security. So, you know, it's like, well, we can't do this now to protect the health of our residents or whatever because we've got to pay the pensions of those people who, you know, future pensions. And so along with the way we produce things and the physical economy, there is, you know, the whole... Um, well, you could say just a, a complete rewrite of how money, tax, um, future security in terms of pensions it, uh, has got to be addressed because that has an, an, a, a huge sway over how companies invest, um, how they, yeah, the whole, the whole system. So I just think, you know, it's, it's important not to forget the money sector, the financial <coughs> sector, yeah. and how yeah. it's really, um, it, it is responsible for upholding the current system, not allowing change, not allowing things to respond to the emergency. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is, that great, sorry, is that Greater Manchester Pension Fund? Um, well, Lancaster. I'm in Lancashire. I just because I was involved in an action which I'm actually due in 
caught for um, <laughs> in about two weeks. And that's uh, a fantastic segue <laughs> to the... Around the GMPF. Segment, but I, but I, think, <laughs> I, I would say, and, and you know, I've been involved in this work on the pension committee for about uh, seven years now, it's not any one fund because there are people mm. there really trying and actually mm. Lancashire has got a good reputation. It's the system itself. It's the whole okay. system. I'm sure we'll come back onto the system, yeah. <laughs> inevitably, in the, the, the final segment. But um, as I said, Joel's reference to being up in court is a <laughs> wonderful um, segue onto the activism segment. Um, again, surprise, surprise, another YouGov poll here, <laughs> um, which is actually quite a telling one, and I'm sure um, one of the more testing ones, that statistics that we'll look at. In October 2019, uh, during the Extinction Rebellion protests, 54% um, of people said that they opposed the XR, the Extinction Rebellion protests. Now, 34% of that was strongly opposed, and 20% was sort of more or less opposed. Um, the movement does seem to be rallying people of similar viewpoints, but is there a fear, for want of a better phrase, that it is turning indifference into opposition? Um, I think how the what the reaction was after the April. If we look at the April um, Extinction Rebellion um, protests, <coughs> they resulted in a huge bump in people being very concerned. Well, they they contributed to um, a huge rise in people being saying they were very concerned about the climate, about the ecological um, crisis, and um, people looking up, you know, searching things on the internet about climate change. Um, and yeah, the uh, protests in October didn't have the same effect. If anything, they seemed to plateau. And <coughs> yeah, um, I think we've also got to factor in the relentless work of the large section of our media, who have obviously gone out of the way to demonise and vilify Extinction Rebellion as a bunch of, you know, fanatics Crosses. who, do, yeah, 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 yeah uncooperative. Uh, hemp-smelling crusties who live in bivouacs. Well, it's such, such a shame that one incident that was reported with somebody had stuck themselves to the tube or well, something. Well, they climbed you know, up, yeah, was, um, ve was not very planned, questionable. Not a planned action, not really... Well, it was, it, was, it was very um, controversial within the movement and without. Yeah. Uh, but it, was, it seemed to say. me it was the one that got the most publicity. Yeah, and it did, because obviously, yeah. obviously. And the, the um, 1,800 arrests went on during October. Um, there were protests, tar there were actions targeting government institutions, you know, major um, fossil fuel you know, industry polluters, financial institutions, um, actions in solidarity with um, people uh, in frontline communities around the world. All of that got pretty much completely ignored um, by the media. <coughs> um, the tube action, yeah. the most controversial, the most potentially um, arguably harmful to the movement um, because it was seen as so targeting the uh, people who were the least responsible, the most vulnerable, and by stopping people who might really need to get to work every single day to you know, keep a roof over their heads getting to work, that got all the attention, that made global news, mm. which kind of yeah. did, like, kind of reconfirmed like, Extinction Rebellion's like, um, fundamental um, idea is that you have to do things sometimes that upset people to force a, an issue into the agenda. and. Um, yeah, I think you have to be. You have to walk a line. If you, you don't want to be turning like passive opposition into active opposition, um, I think it's quite hard to actually do that in reality. Um, but I think it's it's sometimes a bit of a bizarre framing that like people are going to support the collapse of society for their children out of spite because so they are annoyed <laughs> because they didn't get to work on time one yeah. time. Like if people genuinely understand, we're still trying to make people genuinely understand the severity and depth and the immediacy of the crisis. And I think if people do understand that, um, it's harder to be annoyed by, yeah. you know. But I mean, so I think it just highlights the fact that there's still a lot of, you know, groundwork, bottom-up communication, talking mm -hmm. to people, counteracting, counteracting some of the myths. Um, mm -hmm. And I've been involved in a very, well, I was going to say a very localised, but a hugely significant national and international um, protest at Preston New Road. The, against fracking and um, 
and I have to admit, you know, I mean, I was always a little bit of a scaredy cat when it came to doing all that kind of like. Did you end up being fined in court, didn't you? Yeah, so yeah. I did. I did um, actually. Over the year, over the years, I was standing on the streets. I mean, I was, uh, you know, I was a counsellor, and I felt as though it, I can't say, oh, there's there's that role and there's this role. It was really important that I was yeah. there, and then I kind of like grew in confidence, got to meet a whole range of people, um, lovely people um, with some of the best humour I've ever met. So that what I think keeps people going back is just the humour that's around. Um, so I, yeah, I took part in a lock on as well. Mm. But um, but there was what the point I was about to say is there was amazing um, variety of people who got involved in that because it was affecting their local community. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing about climate change where we where it's so for so many people, it's still an abstract concept. Even though you can see, you know, fires raging in Australia, it's, you know, it, it's hard for people to really engage what how that's going to be in their lives. If it's on your doorstep, then it's, it's very yeah. much different thing. And I'm not yeah. saying that people were, were nimbies because once you kind yeah. of see it on your doorstep, you see that you start to see the whole bigger mm. picture. But um, well, the, the phrase is no fracking here, no fracking anywhere. Yeah, exactly. And I do think I, I just because I, I also that was my first. Uh, foray into direct action, I mean, that's what led me to Extinction Rebellion, was the uh, anti-fracking movement, particularly at Preston New Road. Um, and that was an example of such a diverse yeah. movement that brought together people because it threatens everyone, like yeah. rich or poor, like, you know, you may have voted Tory all your life, but, you know, now they want to frack in your backyard. And maybe people start off as NIMBYs, but then they meet these people who come from places they've never really, you know, experienced before. And um, those bonds of solidarity do develop, and I think that's... Yeah, the British anti-fracking movement has been an example of how you can have this a movement that does cross boundaries that often separate yeah. people. And I think um, there's a lot to be learned from that and other movements that have achieved that. Yeah, I mean, we, we talked about sort of own goals, we might be able to call them there, and, and then <laughs> perhaps being somewhat of a, an occupational hazard for any sort of mass movement. Um, but that statistic being as it is, it does seem that a fair number of people have been turned against the movement. And... A lot of people seem to claim that it's fear mongering, now, um, which is one of the less severe mongers, probably behind war. <laughs> but um, how do you combat that then? Because if, if we're, you're in a position, both of you, in separate roles, separate walks of life, as it were, you've chosen the political path, and we have rebellion over here, Extinction Rebellion. You're in a position where you have this knowledge or this wisdom that this is happening and that this needs to be changed. And then you've mentioned the media, the effect that the media have had on reporting the, the man being pulled off the tube rather than reporting, etc. So on and so forth. How do you go about tackling that then? What is the tone that needs to be um, pushed forward in the debate in order to turn that perception around? I think, um, well, we've already said, I, I strongly believe that ha you, you have to start locally or you start, yep. um, you know, we go to where people are. And you do have to bring this down to what actually is affecting people on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. But also, I, I think all of us in this sort of movement, whatever, we've not been good enough at presenting the positive model of what um, life is going to be in a low carbon uh, mm -hmm. economy. And, you know, and I've been, had this luxury just recently of travelling to Strasbourg by the Eurostar. And, you know, it's an amazing city. And the... The public transport system is second to none. But n more than that, they've actually got cars off the road. So, you know, Brussels isn't bad as well when it comes to public transport, but they haven't removed the cars. And it's only when you actually experience a car, you know, it's not totally car free, but, you know, far fewer cars on the road that you actually feel the benefit of low, less noise, getting around really quickly on public transport. It's really cheap, it's efficient. And the quality of life is amazing. You know, it's mm. absolutely amazing. Mm. And so and that could be, trans <coughs> you know, um, translated into all different walks of life. And either we haven't, I, I mean, to some extent in the UK, we haven't got enough ex examples of good practice, whereas they have <laughs> in, in to Europe. To point to and say, look, to point to, this is how And we haven't be. been brave enough to really make those decisions where we can say, um, you know, not not just are we going to make it a little bit easier if you want to make the uh, you know the climate friendly choice, but actually we're going to make it really hard for you if you don't. So, for example, then you get the full benefit of proper cycling, right, yeah. walking infrastructure, yeah. not oh 
we'll put, do it a little bit, but we'll carry on building motorways or whatever. So mm -hmm. you think that the way forward is you've got to really allow people to conceptualise those things? Yes. But in terms and of so the tone of the I, debate, yeah, I, just, just because I wholeheartedly agree, but also I'm on an element of not disagree, but I'll explain You're what You're allowed I mean. to disagree. <laughs> um, yeah, no, debate, I, do, right? I do. Like, I mean, I agree. <laughs> I think the, um, and again, I don't think it's an accident that the, um, environmentalism has been presented as like often counter to like maybe the labor movement or to people's basic everyday needs it's seen as like being restrictive yeah. and like that's not an accidental narrative there are people who have power who have pushed that as a belief that like we either do the environmentally good thing or we can improve your living standards and um, we do need to i mean this this um phrase um private sufficiency public luxury like people would like it if there were electrified rail going everywhere in Manchester, so they didn't have to drive, they didn't have to breathe poisoned air, and if that, if those trams were way cheaper, if not free, I don't think many people would be like, that wouldn't be great, that'd be fantastic, you can yeah. get as drunk as you want and you never have to drive home. Like, those, those massive, massive transformations of public infrastructure um, would benefit everyone, like improving housing, like the things that we need to do to have the sort of transformation to deal with the ecological crisis, like radically improving public transport, radically improving housing. Like these are things that will benefit people and benefit the poorest people the most because they're the ones currently suffering because our public transport's a sick joke. Mm. Housing is a mess. Like these are the things that have to change. But at the same time, just on your question of tone, I think Ex Extinction Rebellion's philosophy has been to really push back against the, the only using positive psychology. Basically telling people a happy story where everything's good and you only benefit. We've really also said we have to tell the truth that the situation is dire mm. and telling a very frightening truth that you don't want to accept will put some people off, but it will seriously motivate a minority of people. Yeah, and I think as well one of the big words in terms of the tone of Extinction Rebellion's dialogue is anger. And I think it's a word that crops up in a lot of Greta Thunberg speeches um, you know, the sort of how dare you rhetoric. Mm. Do you think in some ways, however, that that can turn people off? Because a lot of people don't like to be told, you're wrong, you mm. need to change it, and if you don't change it, we're going to carry on being angry. Yeah, I do. I, I mean, personally, I think people, lots of people are frightened of anger. You know, I mean, it's what motivates a lot of us who are activists or who are in, mm. the, in that. But, um, you know, a lot of people don't like that angry, um, that angry environment. So, I mean, maybe there's, a, there's um, you have to do both, but I, I feel mm. as though what we, I think you were saying, Joel, basically we haven't um, presented the alternative uh, or we haven't got enough positive examples of saying this isn't just about saving the planet. Actually, life becomes a lot easier for, and it levels out. You know, we, we level up for a whole load of people. So just example, mm. you know, the, the housing issues, you know, end fuel proper energy efficiency done properly and it's it's a big job it's you know it's not an easy job it, given the state of our housing stock and we've got so much ha old um, housing stock but actually energy efficiency lower fuel bills warmer environments less health problems you know and creating a whole range of um, really quite satisfying work yeah. in the process. So mm. I, d I, I do think that that is a job to be done alongside the desperate, you know, s telling people how desperate the situation is. And I, I, can't, I was just wondering then whether maybe there's a generational difference because it seems to me young people quite rightly are tapping into the anger because they feel quite rightly they've been shafted by the older generations, you know, that's yeah. the long and short yeah. of it. So, you know, like, how dare you? That's absolutely right. And maybe, I don't know, but maybe there's a possibility that older people need to be more gradually sold the advantages of what life is going to look like as they get older in a zero carbon economy. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just, just on the, I, I, if you look at what Greta says or Extinction Rebellion says, the anger is never directed at ordinary people. Like the messaging no. is never, like yeah, no one's having a go. Upwards. So when you say like people don't like being told that they're wrong, yeah, I'm sure um, the oligarchs who control most of the world don't like being told that what they're doing is wrong um, but I don't think we should shy away from doing that um, and then, yeah it's not even the fault of those individuals it's the systems that allow them to have that power um, but I do think like you, it's a good point like, like I have two sisters in their early 20s 
they do not know what the world is going to look like by the time they're in their 40s. Mm -hmm. They don't feel safe to have children because they don't know what the food situation will be like in mm -hmm. on an island where our food systems are incredibly insecure. Um, they have every right to be furious <laughs> that, at what's happening. And that's not even, that's looking at the future. There's people all around the world who are dying and suffering. Like, look at what's happening in Somalia, like nearly a million people internally displaced because of like drought, flood, crop failure. Like, the idea that anger is not justified a thousand times over, <laughs> yeah. um, I think is part of like this tone policing of like you, you know, you have to be, you know, you don't want to upset people. I think it's, it's we're long past the point okay. where we should not upset people. <laughs> Wonderful. So with that anger firmly in our bellies, <laughs> let's move on to talk back um, about the system, as you both termed it. Um, let's talk about legislation. Um, I understand from what you said earlier that neither of you are quite fond of the system. Um, and we may well cite the lack of proportional representation, etc., in some of these questions, I I'm like pretty to sure that, that Gina <laughs> definitely will, and I'll allow you to cite that. Yeah. But um, the short and sweet of it is, and I'm going to say something. I'm going to do my best, Piers Morgan, to, to <laughs> rattle you, is that there has been a great green option in the House of Commons on the ballot paper for a good number of years, and in the last election, the Green Party got their customary one seat. It was two percent of two point seven percent of the vote share, if I'm not mistaken. Is there an appetite for these policies from the voter, from the constituents? Can I cover up my Extinction Rebellion and just say my own personal, like, um, yeah. I mean, in like, in defence of the Green Party, when you poll people, when you, when you poll people, when you poll people in terms of policies, the Greens are the most popular. And, like, Labour are also very popular. If you actually poll voters by individual policies, the policies of those parties are by far the most popular. Mm. The thing is that, again, the level of centralised corporate control of the media means that a lot of people don't know what the policies are that are attached to the parties. They don't know what they're voting for in a lot of cases. Mm. Um, and obviously the last couple of years have been defined by this single, you know, right. monolithic thing. Um, the but then also I was formally banned from my studio, but <laughs> it's happened so well. But I also think that given the fact that we don't have proportional representation, we do have this ridiculous, ridiculously unfit for purpose, unfit for purpose first past the post system, um, arguably running candidates in national elections, knowing that you now have no chance of winning those elections, is maybe not the tactic you should continue with if you know that that system is still in place. Okay, so Gina, yeah, no, popular no. policies. Yeah, um, so, you know, I would, this is probably the area where we I most strongly disagree <laughs> because, um, because it's a bit like this, uh, this idea, given the fact, this is a fact that we have to change. The mm -hmm. voting system mm -hmm. is so fundamental. I mean, you know, it's, it is about, I, you know, I was tweeting this in one of my um, fits of rage just after the election <laughs> result. But if we're going to say, you know, people have a right to for meaningful work or um, to be able to put food on the table, I feel as though we have, in this day and age, people ha should be able to expect that their vote is meaningful. And we have a system where votes don't count in for a large majority of the people because the way this, the, the first past the so post system means that there's only a few seats across the country where it makes a difference. Um, so we've got a huge challenge, but I think that this has to be part of all talk about um, uh, you know citizens assemblies and empowering people and I would like to see you know massive campaign to get the whole um, citizens political political education back in mm. the into mm. the curriculum across schools because it's so important um, but just in terms of like okay we are where we are with first past the post what um, the disadvantage isn't that just that we don't the Greens don't get more seats. It's just that we don't get the publicity all through the election campaign. You know because because we we've only got one MP, so it it just means that it's a self fulfilling prophecy in terms of you've only got one MP, therefore you don't get coverage. You know, and I think just so we did have Brian Blears on our election. And, <laughs> and you know, Caroline Lucas does such an amazing job as the only MP. But what people don't realise is other things like if we. We got Caroline elected as the Greens because we had a large number of councillors mm. in that area. 
And that's the way in this system that the Greens will gradually challenge the system is by getting more Green councillors. So if we don't stand in the general election, we don't even give a, a voice to all those people working at a local level. You know, so we that's why we stand. And also, you we lose other Caroline loses some support. You know, we just lose even the little bit of publicity we do have. If you don't stand candidates, then you can't say, well, we had a million votes a million votes or whatever, like you've just quoted, oh, it was only that, it was only so many votes you got to, well, yeah. this time. Um, if we didn't stand, we'd be even further um, hammered by those mm. who want to say, well, those, you've got no support, <coughs> you've only got support at local level, your policies don't um, have any yeah. traction at a national level. So okay. we, the Greens absolutely can't give up. And actually, the lesson is really for um, the Labour Party to, to, to take this on board. Now, they are in a position now where they're not going to win a general election with a majority for, well, decades probably, and they need to be looking at this Quite issue. As they, well, <laughs> as the, it's, uh, it's not just me saying yeah. this, <laughs> or it's not me saying this, this is a, you know, across the board. Yeah. They need to be looking at proportional representation mm -hmm. if they're going to um, actually look put their money where their mouth is and do something for the country. Okay. I'm quite aware that we're running out of time and I've got a lot that I really <laughs> want to talk to you about. So I'm going to rattle off a few questions and ask for sure. maybe short responses so that we can get, get the, the viewers to, to listen to some of these answers. Um, it does seem that a lot, one of the knee-jerk reactions when it comes to dangerous substances, let's call them, um, is to... No, 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 no. Not, we're not talking drugs. No, we're not talking drugs. Oh, okay. we're, talking, we're talking fossil fuels. <laughs> oh, right, okay. and, yeah. <laughs> cigarettes and alcohol and whatnot. Right. Is to tax them. Now, I want to get roughly where you stand on taxation, because I know that the Green Party, Caroline Lucas, about a year ago, proposed a, a meat tax, yeah. um, which, um, from public opinion, again, I'm sure you'll cite the media and spins and whatnot, um, didn't gain a lot of traction. Um, where do you stand on taxing things? Because it does seem for a large portion of the public that if something is wrong in principle, then it should be wrong for everybody and not just wrong for the poor. Ta it, taxing things is about, basically, bringing in what the costs that are currently externalized you know we're, we're saying basically that we need to make the cost the carbon cost we need to give it a monetary value and that's why you start taxing it but the point is then anyway is that people use then less or buy less of it and sometimes you also propose on the things, whole on the whole you propose things to get them into discussion you know no one's going to starve because the meat's more expensive. You know, this isn't by, by actually penalising people. This is saying actually people could be better off if we actually saw a much higher standard of meat um, being produced and people eating far, far less of it. You know, so it's it's about shifting the debate. So tax taxing the evils, if you like, it's hmm. definitely got a role. Definitely. Okay. Where we in this, it, where we are now. For sure. Yeah, well, where, where would you stand on something like a meat tax from your point of view? I mean, there's um, a, a risk that it would danger industries and would have a, some negative effects, but what, where, where would you stand on taxation of meat? Um, I think this is where, I mean, as, as a you know, rep of Extinction Rebellion, um, why we're focusing on the Citizens' Assembly and that at least being a, an anchor for we need a radical democratisation unlike anything we've ever seen to govern this transition. We need, for the first time in history, really, um, or at least in the history of the nation state, for ordinary people to actually be guiding their own society. Because these changes are going to have to be radical. Well, to Would you want to run through what the Citizens' Assembly like, is for, for the I mean, it's, it's, um, it briefly? It's, and it's an idea for how to make decisions. It was used um, around the Irish abortion question, and it's what led to the referendum. It's basically where you use sortition selection, which is like um, how juries are selected, where a random selection of the uh, population is taken, um, invited to take part, um, so that it's demographically representative, so it actually does represent a population, uh, like evenly and fairly, um, as well, and including in a spectrum of views. Um, and then those people are given the most up-to-date evidence and science by the people most qualified to present it, um, and then a proper deliberative discussion is facilitated, and that's how um, policy decisions <coughs> are, are made um, and it's basically just saying that's the direction of travel we need so like on questions of like a meat tax or, or any tax or any kind of policy like that, that we to need system. to be like involving people the people in a way that has not really happened before because um, yeah I mean but I think that's a really good point though that like an idea of like the rich can do what they want 
poor people can't afford to do the things that like a, that doesn't seem like a just solution by any means. Um, I think with something like air travel, you could have like you can have like frequent, frequent fly, flight. like frequent eater. You can try and do things in a fairer way, but again, um, I think it's still talking about what should be taxed and at what level. Um, is not really taking the scale or the immediacy of the transformation that needs to happen, but also it's not saying that actually we need to stop having a small number of people at the top of society making these decisions unaccountably as well. And and to be fair, that you know, as Greens or Green Party policies, we'll be doing a lot more anyway to reduce the overall income inequalities. You know what I mean? So you'll be taxing income tax mm -hmm. level, you know, raising income tax levels at higher ends. So you know some of these things. It's part of a mechanism to start, yeah, yeah reducing carbon emissions, if you yeah. like. Mm. I because, it, I mean, what you're saying is with um, the citizens' assembly, which is absolutely great, and I was saying earlier on that I think you know all of this has to have a kind of a bottom-up approach. But at the end of the day, what we want is people to eat less meat. <laughs> mm. <laughs> or mm. no meat, or change mm. the production system, to or put it back you know, on philosophical so, grounds then. Do the ends justify the means? Well, it depends. No, if I the aim, say... If the aim is to, to get people to eat less meat and you think that there are... Because I think a lot of people do feel they're in a position of choosing A or B. I mean, I know you said earlier there's this rhetoric that the world's going to collapse if we stop fossil fuel production and that we need to make it more of a positive rhetoric. But people do often <laughs> feel in sort of catch-22 situation maybe that it's, it's A or B. Is it a case of we said earlier, just cut it and then deal with it after? Do you think you, you are going to potentially alienate section of society if you up income tax or if you tax meat uh, do you think it's just tough we need to it needs to be done to some extent yeah. yeah to some extent I mean politicians make decisions that massively harm people in society every day yeah doesn't usually seem to bother them um, what we're talking about is maybe limiting the power of the people who have loads of power um, not actually we're not talking about doing things that should land on the shoulders of those least able to bear the weight I think that's what's really important. That's kind of the idea yeah. of the need for radical democratization. So we saw in France with like the the, the gilets jaunes. Like you can't just massively increase the tax on diesel for people who rely on mm. diesel yeah. to work and live every single day. First, you have to put public transport in place, so they don't back need to what it. Gina was saying like, earlier, doesn't it, about seeing the practicable changes that if you can see that public transport does work and you have the option there already, then and you it can, has to yeah. be in I mean, place yeah. first. Yeah. So you yeah. can't expect Quite, people yeah. to, you know, hope for that in the future. Mm. You've got to invest mm. right now in those changes and then withdraw the mm. other. Yeah, yeah, and I suppose what's interesting about Les Gilets Jaunes was that in, it started off as a protest against a fuel tax and then mm. turned into a much bigger, wider mm. societal movement against systems of power, actually. Yeah, and I, I think that there's some people, I think, who have this crude idea of environmentalism or of Extinction Rebellion would say, like, oh, they, you know, the LFS were on the other side, and I, I don't think that's true at all. Like, I think that was an example of what like neoliberal climate policy would be shifting the burden onto those least responsible, those least able mm. to bear it, um, and yeah, I yeah. think like that's what what we're seeing in France is is amazing. Like it's a, a, a huge society-wide yeah, yeah uprising yeah. against uh, austerity and against these uh, unfair like economic yeah. policies that are also the ones like ruining uh, the ecosphere. So yeah, yeah I'm all. All in favour. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one final point. We often get this cited, um, that the UK's global emissions is only 2%. We've only got about a minute left. So um, <laughs> I'm going to give you the opportunity to vent your ire at that. Yeah, well, um, obviously, because we have shifted the burden of all our, or not all, but so many, so much of our carbon to, well, to all the other big... Um, Producers, so it's very convenient of the government to just come back to this two percent issue. Mm. Um, still, per head, we are in in terms of the embodied carbon and and some of the other issues like embodied water and some of the other scarce resources that we're actually going to have to start um, taking into account. We're way 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 okay. up there. John, so, I'm going to give you. I mean, about twenty seconds to to squeeze. Yeah, in people the... say the whole like, oh, but China. It's like, well, who who do you think China produces Produce all those things, yeah. things for? We're consuming them. We've exported our carbon emissions. Greta made a very good point when she spoke in Parliament. It's just clever accounting tricks. And Britain also has a huge 
carbon debt. Like it's the first industrialized, it's one of the major colonial powers. Like we've built our wealth on fossil fuelism um, and we have a historical and current responsibility to be transforming. Excellent. Right, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for today. Um, big thanks to our guests for such an engaging discussion and we'll see you next time.